Package Your Genius Academy's fall enrollment season is coming to a close. If you are interested in learning how to clarify the gift that you have to offer the world, or at least the current stage of that gift, clarify what it is and how to message that gift and communicate what you have to share and offer to other people, you'll want to learn more about Package Your Genius Academy. Welcome to Package Your Genius. I'm your host, Amanda Miller Littlejohn. I'm a former print journalist turned PR and personal branding pro, and I am here to help high achievers like you bring your genius ideas to life. Whatever gift you have to give the world, I want to be a catalyst for your next genius move. If you're ready to stop overthinking it and start putting yourself out there, you're in the right place. Let's go. I've recently held a brand new personal branding masterclass and the topic was becoming known the five shifts required to unlock your personal brand authority. As I mentioned on the last episode, this idea of authority, personal brand authority is really what I believe the missing piece is between those of us who have extraordinary gifts and talents and are creating powerful results for our employers and for our clients and for the people in our lives. But we have not stepped into this idea of becoming known. We have not allowed ourselves to leverage our talents for our own goals and desires. Personal brand authority is something that maybe you need if um, you have yet to really step into the earning potential that you know you have to step into launching the projects, the books, the businesses, etc., that you you know that you want to have, or even stepping into a pivot, uh, moving from one type of success to another type of success, moving from successfully selling products and services to stepping into the role of an expert and being an author and a speaker and a coach and someone who is called to lead other people. So I wanted to share the masterclass here on the podcast with you in hopes that it can help you unlock your own personal brand authority. Here you go. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's so good to be here with you all tonight to talk about personal branding, to talk about personal brand authority, and just to spend a little bit of time digging into our goals and our dreams. We have a brand new quarter upon us. The start of Q4 was but a few days ago. So I'm hoping that our conversation tonight can really help you as you begin to make the personal shifts you need to make in order to be seen as the expert that you are both in the end of you know, the final months of the year and the next year that is upon us, which is actually the beginning of a new decade, which I just realized a few days ago. How about that? Um, I don't know about you, but I am ready to really put myself out there in a bigger way and claim all that is here for me in the next decade. But tonight I wanted to talk about something a little different than I usually talk about. And so some of you all know me. Some of you all have worked with me before. Some of you all, we have never met. Hey, Susan Burroughs from California. Um, Excited to have you here. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about what I want to talk about tonight. Um, So I will introduce you or introduce myself to those of you who don't know me and aren't really familiar with my work because I know that Crowdcast broadcasts everywhere. And so you may have found me and this training through Crowdcast. So, but before we jump into who I am, I wanna tell you a little bit about who I've designed this conversation for. And so I'm Amanda, I'm the founder of Packager Genius Academy. Um, this training is specifically for high achievers. So 
I love all sorts of achievers, but I have found in my work that the people who resonate the most with me are those who have operated in excellence for years, maybe even decades. I know for me, I've been high achieving since I was a child, <laughs> trying to make those A's in school and achievement has really been a big part of my life. And now I'm deepening that sense of just trying to strive for the next level. Um, and taking that inward and going deeper and achieving the goals that I'm setting for myself internally. So this is for high achievers. So people who take pride in, in delivering great results, you have a great reputation among friends and colleagues for doing great work. This training is also for the lifelong learners among us. So those of you who love to learn and improve yourself and you're open to trying new things, um, you maybe even understand that phrase, new levels, new devils. So you know that as we strive and we continue to move up those ladders and, and embody new levels of ourselves, new challenges are bound to come up. And so you're aware of that and you're ready to dive into that. And maybe visibility is one of those challenges that has kind of come up for you at this stage in your life and in your development. This training is also for some of those who consider ourselves unsung heroes. So we've been in the background for a lot of our careers, or maybe we're the person that's next to the main person. But we have this nagging sense that people aren't really aware of all that we're capable of. So if that resonates with you, you're definitely in the right place. And this training is also for those who are called for more. So you've reached a point in your life. It may have been a milestone birthday. A lot of people reach out to me when they hit a certain age and they're just like, hold on, <laughs> is this all I'm supposed to be doing? There's more that I want to do. I never wrote that book. I never started that business. And I'm wondering if I'm running out of time or if, if this is ever going to happen for me. And I know that I can't keep putting it off. I'm called for something more. I have something more that I want to deliver and that I want to give. Um, there's another way that I want to use my gifts, but I'm just not really sure how that works. Um, but I know I'm called for more. Hey, Samantha. So this is, I have to pause. One of the things I love about coming on platforms like this is really getting a chance to see and interact with some of you that I don't get to see that often or talk to that often. Um, we have, you know, moved to different cities or you have moved on in your work. You're here, you're there, I'm here, I'm doing my thing. But it's so amazing to hear and see some of you that I've worked with in the past and I've known for years along this journey. So when I tell my story, some of you are gonna be like, oh yeah, I remember that, Amanda. <laughs> I remember 2010, Amanda. Um, and some of you have been with me and been kind of in my orbit for that long. So it's exciting to see you, to see you all here. So what I plan to share this evening, just so you have an idea, I'm a control freak. So I always like to know when I get into a car, where are we going? And where are we stopping along the way? So I know if we're on track. So that is uh, what you see on your screen right now. I'm going to talk about why so many of us struggle with seeing the truth of ourselves. And that's really become such a big part of my work. Um, I have been doing personal branding, started with PR and before that journalism work. And I think a common theme that has emerged in this work is just so, so many of us struggle to see ourselves clearly. And that's honestly the reason why I have a business is because I do have a gift for seeing um, you and what you have to offer very clearly and helping you articulate that. But I want to talk a little bit about why so many of us struggle with seeing the truth of ourselves and the value that we have to offer the world. We're going to talk about uh, what we need to do to move from being good and to to being known, right? So not just being good at what we do, not just delivering great results, but how do we make ourselves known? I'm gonna share with you as promised in the title of the class, the five shifts you need to make to step into that sense of being known and to step into your personal brand authority. I'll talk to you about what personal brand authority is and how to step into that. And then I'm going to talk about the nine steps to becoming known in your field and how I have used these steps over several career pivots and how I've taught the steps to dozens of my clients 
too. And I'm going to share how simple and straightforward this process can be if you let it. I really want um, you guys to understand that I'm a pretty straightforward person. I'm a straight shooter and I don't want to overload you with a lot of work that will be overwhelming to you, but I also don't want to kind of, you know, powder you in fluff. I hate fluff. I'm not a fluff person. Um, but at the same time, I want you to understand that like sometimes as high achievers, we can really overcomplicate things. And the process is really straightforward if you just want to know what to do. So if you are here because you know, you know that you're ready to move and you simply just want a plan, some steps, you know, what am I doing? What am I not doing? Am I on the right track to this? I'm going to absolutely give you that. I'm going to give you the nine things that you need to be thinking about and the nine things that you need to be doing at the very end of the training. And for those who actually need some support executing that and moving through those nine steps, I'm going to offer you a chance to work with me, of course, right? So we're here to learn about personal branding, but I'm also understanding that there's only so much we can do in the hour or hour and a half that we're going to be here tonight. And so for those of you who are like, okay, that was great. That was a lot. But Amanda, I could really use your support. I'm going to share with you how you can get that over the next couple of months. So if that sounds good, let us keep going. So as I promised, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. And I think, let me know if you can see my whole screen. I feel like yeah, I feel like my screen is a little cut off. So hold on. You just make that a little smaller so you can see. Or a little bigger, rather. Bigger, smaller, which one? Okay, I think that's it. There we go. Everything's in there. All right, so first of all, who am I? So as you see on the side of the slide, all of these different pictures of me kind of in action. So that's me actually... Um, Last week on the far left, I'm on stage. I was speaking at an event in North Carolina. I was talking about um, influence and how to land media exposure. And here on the right, you see me actually in a few different media segments. And then in the middle, I was doing a paid talk um, for Spotify, which is something that I honestly never saw myself doing a decade or so ago, like being a speaker who not only shares her expertise, but is paid handsomely for that. But it all started around the Great Recession. So I was a former, well, I am a former journalist, but at the time I thought that I was going to be doing long form narrative journalism. And I ended up losing my newspaper reporting job at the height of the Great Recession. And I did what many people do who leave journalism. I went into PR. But for me, um, it, it wasn't so much of a kind of, well, I'll do PR since I can't do journalism, but it was really me following a calling to do what I did understand I was really great at, which was telling people stories, hearing what they were really trying to say, and then helping them articulate um, the story that they were trying to tell to the world. And so now I've kind of crystallized that whole concept down to the phrase package your genius. So whatever your genius is, I'm the kind of the interpreter and the translator that can help you package it for the world. And so I, I started doing that. I felt like I had skills, talents, writing talents. Um, I had gifts that I could share. And I, I knew that I could help people. But moving from journalism to this communication space, I realized that I had to become known. Like I had to become a known name very quickly because I would go to events and people didn't know who I was. And so in the process of realizing that, I started sharing and teaching and learning um, things around social media and digital communications and sharing what I was learning along the way. And that quickly amounted to me getting invited to share more things and to help people and to support through coaching and consulting. And pretty quickly, I, I tripled my newspaper salary pretty much right out of the gate during this recession. So I remember it was 2008. It was like the spring of 2008 when I landed my first communications contract, which was really exciting uh, going from being this laid off journalist thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do to really activating my skills and talents and figuring out 
who needed what I had and who would be willing to pay for it. And so I moved into PR. Um, I, I managed to not only land clients who were willing to pay me to help them with their communications in PR, but I go from this unknown, you know, former journalist who, you know, just no one really knew in the DC area to winning national awards in the industry because I wasn't afraid to put myself out there. And sometimes I attribute that to not having studied uh, PR. So I, I got my degrees in English and history. So I'm a writer, a historian, you know, I love to understand how things came to be. And I love to story kind of emerged and, and what happened before this point to get us here. And I think that not knowing what, what people who studied PR and communications knew just made me hungrier. And it almost made me naive because I didn't know that there were certain things that maybe other people weren't doing. So I just did all that I knew to do. I put myself out there. I um, sent my name out to speak and do webinars and trainings. I wrote a book. Like I just was doing all kinds of stuff and it worked. And again, I stumbled upon a process that I didn't even know I was um, doing. It just sort of happened. And after that, I pivoted again, even after winning some national recognition in PR, I really decided that my heart wasn't in PR so much as it was in helping individuals. And so I'd been working with nonprofits and bigger organizations. And I just decided like, I love helping people. I help individual people because I want to be a part of their personal journey. Um, and I want to feel like I'm making an impact at that ground level um, where they are. And I want to be able to see what they need. And I want to see the impact of my work. So I pivoted from straight PR to actual um, personal branding and um, ended up getting more national recognition. So the process that I was using was kind of proven to work even after I moved from one area to the next. Uh, a couple other points just about me. I'm a super introvert, super introvert. <laughs> I spend like 12 hours in the forest by myself every week. It's my new favorite thing to do. And yet, even though I'm this big introvert, I still, um, am able to put myself out there in a way that makes sense for me. So for those of you who may be introverts, I tend to attract those who identify as introverts. There's still a way for you to put yourself out there and become a known name without it overloading you and overwhelming your sensibilities. Um, you don't have to be this extrovert who wants to be here and there and everywhere to become a known name. You can act absolutely uh, become a known name in your pace, in your way, in the style that makes the most sense for you. Uh, and then just personally, I'm a coffee lover, jazz aficionado. I'm an old soul. I feel like I've been 80 since I was born. <laughs> and so I feel like when I am 80, if I make it to 80, I will finally feel like I'm my age. But I'm an old soul. I have two amazing kids, Logan and Connor, who um, are artists as well. And we have a great time creating. And I love helping them package their genius as well. So that's me. So for those of you who just met me, I hope that gave you an overview. For those of you who already know me, you're probably like, okay, Amanda, I know all that. <laughs> so let's talk about you. So. Tell me if this at all, and see, again, I feel like I'm losing a word on my screen here. Okay, there we go. Tell me if this sounds like you at all. So you've, you've spent your career somewhat in the background, and you know that you need to put yourself out front to reach the goals that you have for yourself. It may not be that you are craving the spotlight or you want all this attention, but you know that if more people don't know who you are, the big goals you have for yourself just are not going to come to fruition. They're not going to move. And so you've reached an impasse of where um, it may not even be that you have the time or you feel like you have the time or you feel like you have the interest, but you know you've got to start getting out front to get to where you want to be. Um, you may be under earning, which breaks my heart because I talk to so many people in this line of work who are tremendously talented, have so much to offer, and yet 
are not earning what they could simply because they haven't stepped into um, the rightful place that their gifts and their talents have earned, right? So Andrea is saying that she can definitely relate to one through four. Um, number three, maybe you have received several brilliant ideas for businesses or nonprofits, books or podcasts, but you just can't bring yourself to birth it. Like you may even have PR and marketing skills, right? I talk to a lot of people who do marketing and PR for bigger organizations or for other people, but for some reason they just have a block on doing that for themselves. So you may even have the book, How to Start a Business in 17 Steps, or have read how to put yourself out there, but for some reason it's just not clicking, it's not connecting. You can't you know, force yourself or get over that like energetic hump of, of just doing it, of just going for it. And so you intellectually understand like what you need to do and you know how to Google, right? Because everything's on Google. You can find out how to do everything online, but you just are having trouble stepping into it and making that shift. And that is, it's really heartbreaking when you feel like you've got all this that's been placed on your heart and on your, your mind and on your life and you just can't step into it. Um, you may have had a degree of success in your business. So some of you all are entrepreneurs. Some of you all are already small business owners. So it's not just employees and people who work for companies. And maybe you have had success. You've landed contracts. You've gotten clients. But you know that the level of success you are really craving and the level of success that you see yourself on, that you, if you really allow yourself to to dream and to be honest about what you want. If you're really honest with yourself, you know that you want more, right? You want more than what's already there and you need to figure out how can you get in front of more people in order to make that happen. Uh, you may be a person who fears that if you don't figure out how to put yourself out there, you'll never be able to get out of the gate on the way to this big goal. And maybe you feel like you're letting yourself down simply by not getting this figured out. I know for me, when I have a big goal that stays on my vision board or my to-do list for too long, I start to get this sense of foreboding. Like, what am I doing? Like, why am I not creating a plan to make this happen? Is this not important to me? Um, I feel like it is important to me. So why am I not moving on that? And so then I start to feel like I'm letting my dream down and I'm letting myself down because that dream and that goal was given to me for a reason. I truly believe that. And so when I'm not able to act on the things that were given to me, it kind of makes me say, well, gosh, what am I doing? What am I doing? That's my, that's my genius idea. Why am I not bringing it to life? All right. <clears throat> so what's the real issue here? So this is honestly, um, this is something I've been thinking a lot about, and especially on my long walks in the forest, I've been thinking about, you know, what keeps people who know intellectually what they need to do. They know the steps. They understand the how-to. They can give you the 10 steps of what they need to do. What is keeping them from, from executing on the steps they need to take to become known? And what's the real issue that's at the heart of their hiding and their invisibility? And what I've come up with is um, this idea of personal brand authority. So we've yet to step into the success that our hard work has earned us. If you are a high achiever and you have spent any length of your career with your head down doing the work, I want you to type into the chat, head down, just so I know. So if you've had your head down and you've been doing the work and you, a mantra for you has even been, if I do good work, if I keep my head down and just work hard, people will recognize my hard work and they will reward me for it. My hard work will speak for itself. Right. Um, so I see a cup. I see Samantha says head down. Sloan says head down. Thank you for sharing that. Gertie says head down. Hey, Gertie. <laughs> oh, my God. I love seeing like.
like my alumni on here. Hey, Gertie. Tiffany says, until very recently. I know that's right, Tiffany. Kim says, head down. So um, for many of us, we grew up on this idea that if we worked harder, if we pushed harder, if we applied more effort, if we got more A's, if, if we got more done, if we were more productive, um, and if we were able to stretch our talents to their max and, you know, st strip everything out of them, get everything out of them and just deliver more, 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 that's all we have to do. We don't have to market ourselves. We don't have to tell the story. We don't have to pick up the microphone and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. The work speaks for itself. But I'm here to tell you, as I'm sure you figured out by now, that that's not the case. You've got to step into your personal brand of authority. And personal brand authority means moving from doing the work, right? Head down, getting the work done, being happy that results are being created for whomever you're you're working in service to, whether that's your, your company, your boss, your clients, if you have your own business, your customers. Um, so moving from just doing this great work to owning the results and the rewards of doing that great work, right? So I'm going to say that again because it's it's it sounds simple, but it's like, okay, what does that mean to own it, right? So it's, it, it, it goes from, um, am I doing a good job to what impact have I made and how can I celebrate the impact that I'm making in the lives of my clients, in the bottom line of my company? And you know what? I have done some great work and I have moved the needle. I'm amazing. And the world needs to know about it. My industry trades need to know about it. I need to be speaking on stages and sharing what I know because I'm doing some amazing things here, right? So that's the personal brand authority going from, am I doing a good job? Was that okay? I hope, I hope, you know, you got all you needed out of me to, I know I moved the needle, right? It's a sense of confidence, um, a sense of owning not only that you're good and not only that you've done great work, but you have something special that has been um, utilized by whomever is, is, is getting that benefit now, but could also be leveraged and utilized wherever you decide to, to move it, right? Wherever you decide to take that value and share it, like it's yours, it's inherent to you. Uh, it is not, you aren't made by a company or by a client, but you inherently have a gift and brilliance and genius that can change other people's lives. And owning that, like really coming face to face with the realization that what you have is life changing for other people if you choose to share it. And so that is personal brand authority, um, which I feel like is the missing piece. It's where we're not connecting all of the tactics and all of the know-how of, you know, getting ourselves out there and putting ourselves out there. It's that confidence. It's the opposite of imposter syndrome. It's really owning who we are. So I want to talk about the five shifts that you need to make. And there's my face. I tried to pick a picture that I felt embodied each shift, which is a, it's actually harder than you would think. <laughs> but I want to talk about the five shifts that I promised you before I take you through nine steps of actually becoming visible, if that's what you're interested in. So number one, shift number one, you have to understand your value and decide to leverage it for yourself. So I put my smiling face there because that's exactly what I did unknowingly in 2008 after being laid off, after having a newborn, after finding out I was pregnant with my second child with no job and my husband had no job. But there was just this inherent understanding that I had that I had talent, skills, and a gift of communication. And I know how to listen to people. And part of that, I think, came from journalism. But part of it, it you know, I can't even really attribute it to journalism. It goes back even farther than that. Because even when I was in school, I remember being in middle school, I always had guy friends. I had a brother. So um, I related well with boys, like I could talk to them. And um, 
I remember just, I would always get guys to open up. Like they'd tell me about their crushes. They'd tell me about what was bothering them. They'd tell me about their deepest fears. And even back then without knowing it, I just knew how to connect with people and ask the question under the question uh, and really get to the heart of what you're really trying to say or what you're not facing or what the real problem is that's keeping you from getting whatever you want or doing whatever it is that you want. And so to me, that listening skill and really just caring about people, caring that people actually achieve their goals and move forward and do what they want to do. And then the actual practical skill of writing coupled in with that listening piece is just its value, right? So many people don't listen or don't listen well. And a lot of people you know, may be able to listen, but they can't turn around and write what you're saying. And I remember even when I was in middle school and high school, I used to write poems and um, everybody knew me as like this poet. And sometimes I would write something and my friends would say, wow, you really captured how I felt, you know, about a situation through your words. And so that ability to capture a sentiment, to capture and to be able to hear what you're feeling and, and what you're trying to say, it's not coming out that way, but you're trying to say that for me to be able to capture that into words and then give that to you so that you can then share with someone else and they understand um, what you're trying to say. That's valuable. That's a gift. And so for me to understand my value and say, OK, I have this value. How can I leverage it for me? Right. I've been laid off from my newspaper job. How do I take this value, this valuable thing that I have and use it to create income? <laughs> and that's essentially what I did. I figured out who needed that skill of writing, who needed someone to help them translate their ideas and who could actually afford to pay for it. And I combined those two things and kind of created my list of targets of, of companies and, and individuals that I thought might be able to use my writing services. But it started with not me saying, okay, who who is who would be willing to give me a job um, or, um, you know, who's going to help me out? But me owning my value and saying, this is what I need from this. I need money. <laughs> I need money from the value I'm creating. How do I generate that? Now, if my need was not money. So just to give you an understanding, it's not just about like um, earning more money or landing a job or starting a business. but um, Leveraging it for yourself can mean whatever you want. So maybe, um, maybe my goal was to, you know, if I hadn't met my husband yet, maybe my goal would have been to meet my soulmate. So I want to leverage this value for myself. And I'm going to leverage that in terms of helping me write something, maybe write a dating profile. I don't know, or write something that communicates um, what I'm looking for and who I am and my heart and soul and gets to the heart of me so that I can connect with someone who's interested in me and wants those same things. So it's, it's the same concept, but it's instead of simply giving your skills away, which so many of us do, especially those of us who wrote head down, right? So you have, you know, kept your head down and you've been working and you have not been leveraging that value. You have not owned and claimed that value and decided to leverage it for yourself. You're simply leveraging it for the people who pay you or the people who ask you for your help. And that's that brings me to another point. A lot of times, People in our lives can see very clearly the value we bring to the table, which is where you'll see those requests from friends and family members to help them with different things, right? Not, I'm not saying help me move, but like help me rewrite my resume. Help me think through my negotiation strategy for my new job. Um, help me figure out how I can help my child uh, who's struggling at school. I feel like, you know, maybe he needs to be on a different learning track to meet his learning needs. And I understand you're really great at understanding learning styles of kids. So help me understand that. So when you hear people ask for your help and thank you for things, they're telling you how you're already showing up in the world. But your job, once you step into this personal brand authority, is to understand and own that value for yourself so that you can leverage it for whatever it is that you want.
So I see we still have people filing in. Hi, Christopher from Ohio. Welcome. Welcome to the training. We're just getting into the five shifts that you need to make to step into this personal brand authority. All right. So shift number two, and we have a familiar face here on the screen, a couple of familiar faces uh, of people who may even be on right now. So <laughs> shift number two, understand that she or he <laughs> who is willing to be visible is she who reaps the reward. And since we have Tiffany actually um, on the training today, and I think Amber may be here too, you all can share, you can pop into the chat and say, you know, whether or not you feel that is true. But um, just to give you an idea, these two, two images or a series of images on the side are Package of Genius Academy alum and participants of our PR program, Maximum Exposure. So that's Tiffany at um, on various media segments that she has had in the last few months. And then at the bottom, you see um, one of our other students, Amber Cabral, who um, put her decided to put herself out there into the media and she landed several, um, several opportunities to write for Fast Company, as well as a feature in the Washington Post Express and a TV segment to promote her diversity and inclusion business. So this idea of being willing to be visible is really important because what you'll find if you're the person who has traditionally had this head down approach, you've typically had your head down in service to someone else or some other entity. OK, and so when you think about the other entity that you've had your head down in service of, they are likely a visible entity and they're reaping the rewards of being willing to step out there and and say who they are and say what they do. And they're reaping the rewards of your hard work, like your hard work is making um, their success um, possible. Another thing I meant to say about shift number one, stepping into your inherent value, for those of us who are still not sold on the idea that um, our gifts and talents have uh, value in the marketplace, right? So you may not want to start a business and, and, and by no means do I recommend that everyone start a business, but I do want everyone to understand the inherent value that you have if you've ever had a job, if you currently have a job, say you're making, you know, 50,000, 100,000, $200,000 a year from your job, the value that you're creating for the person or the company that's paying you is likely 10 times that or more. And if it was not, then there would be, it just wouldn't make mathematical sense for them to pay you at the rate that they're paying you. And so businesses are built upon hiring people because those people can generate, you know, more value so that they can earn more money. They're not hiring you out of charity. They're not paying you because they like you and you do a great job. They're paying you because some aspect of your work, even if you work in nonprofit. If you do programs in a nonprofit, um, you're building their capacity so they can serve more people and they can apply for bigger grants, right? If you are working in a corporation, you are, you know, filling the gaps in their business or you're helping them expand their production so they can make more widgets and make more money. But your role is directly tied to some sort of economic value for whoever's paying you. And I just want you to understand that. And so that idea of deciding that you want to leverage that value for yourself is powerful. Should you choose to do it, I just want you to know you're already being leveraged. And so if you had any doubt about, well, could I get anything in the market? Am I worth anything? You already are being leveraged. Uh, you just may not know it. So, um, but being willing to be visible is, it's really the key to everything. Like, I, I can't express to you how, how happy I am that I was not afraid in the beginning. Like, again, I'm a total introvert. And I remember um, 
very early on after getting laid off from the newspaper job and deciding, okay, I need to get out here and let people know I can write and that they can, you know, pay me for that. But no one knows who I am. So let me start networking. <laughs> and uh, I remember being nervous, but just kind of like forcing myself to get up, get out there. You know, I remember taking a flyer that talked about my blog and what my blog was about because I wanted people to read my blog and just to stay in touch with me. But like, I didn't really know what I was doing but I was willing to be visible. I was willing to be seen because I knew that no one was gonna see me if I was sitting at home. Now, so much has changed in terms of like, even right now, I'm visible to dozens of you all and I'm in my house, you know, on a Sunday evening, technically alone, but like I'm here with you. And so, so much has happened technology wise in the last decade that just allows anyone at any level of willingness to be seen, to get in front of people. But really, if you are willing to be visible, you will reap the reward. No matter how hard you work, if you're not willing to be visible, it's so much harder to reap the rewards. And once you understand that and almost just kind of resign yourself to it, like, look, I don't even necessarily want to be seen and known and visible, but I know that if people don't know that I'm here, I just can't, I can't grow to the level that I want to. All right. <clears throat> Shift number three. And I, I think I mentioned when we started that I am a pretty tactical person. So this is kind of like the most woo-woo training I've ever done, to be honest with you. Let me take a sip of water. And those of you who've been with me um, for years know I'm pretty much like, okay, this is what you need to do. One, two, three, four, five, six. But I'm telling you, spending this time in the forest has made so much clear to me. Um, and a lot of it is not as straightforward as, you know, do more work, get more results. A lot of it is how we need to shift internally to step into the place that we want to be. So the shift, the third shift is you have to stop ignoring the call of your purpose. You have to honor your inner wisdom. This photograph is one of my earliest clients, Tamika Felder, who is this amazing um, women's health advocate, she survived cervical cancer and she had this calling to help other women build community around um, dealing with the cervical cancer diagnosis. So on the one hand, she was called to help to help other women who were kind of going through what she'd gone through. But on the other hand, she had this, you know, good government job that paid her well. And I remember speaking with her, she was so afraid of walking away from like um, the equity and the money that she had built up there, the benefits, et cetera, and really step into running her organization full time. And like after she had answered the first call of just doing it, it became, it kept tugging at her harder and harder. And it became harder for her to show up at her job and just, you know, be happy and do her work, knowing that there was this huge, enormous global purpose for her life. She had been invited to speak in different countries and paid by companies to share her story. And so she eventually you know, stepped away and decided I'm leaving, I'm leaving this job. I'm going to, you know, stop ignoring the call and I'm going to honor my wisdom. I'm going to not deny it and I'm going to follow it. And can I tell you that in the last few years, I mean, she's been doing the nonprofit work for years, but doing it full time, I think it's maybe been two or three years. And the things that she's been able to do, like she ne she didn't miss a beat. She didn't miss the money. She actually grew her revenue um, in her company. She's able to um, bring new projects to light that she'd always wanted to. She wrote a book. I mean, she did all these amazing things. She's doing all of these amazing things. But it started with that little tug that 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 we all feel. And, and I know I said it kind of sounds woo woo because it's hard to really articulate and capture it in words um, and without, you know, having a tangible thing to show you. Like I can pick up this microphone or I can hold up this phone and you know it's a phone. But when I say 
the inner wisdom and the in the internal call it's harder to describe but we all know it and we all feel it whether we're religious or spiritual and to us we interpret that as god or the holy spirit or you know the universe speaking to us we all have that intuition that inner knowing that's tugging at us when it's time for us to do something differently when it's time for us to to do something bigger than what we're doing when we have been ignoring right um that thing that we're supposed to do that only we can hear right like there's nobody else out there who is who can verify <laughs> what my inner wisdom is telling me i have i have to be comfortable and trust and and knowing in that and trust that that inner wisdom, that inner voice, that call that's calling to me is for me. And I have to stop ignoring it and honor it. And so while that may not sound like personal branding, it really is. Because if you're you know, ready to become a name that people know, and you're ready to really step into this season of visibility and abundance, it takes a, a, a deal of faith. And it takes um, your willingness to not know how everything is going to unfold and how everything is going to shake out. But if you hear that call and you feel that tug, knowing that, okay, I can't keep ignoring it. I'm not willing to keep forsaking myself. I see Risha is in the house. Hey, Risha. <laughs> <clears throat> Dr. Moxley. All right, shift number four. We are making our way, making good time too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shift number four, I want you to embrace the fact that anything is possible and your life can be completely different. Now, this is Dr. Alyssa Richardson, who has a, an amazing story. And you can go and watch the video where she shares her story on PackageYourGeniusAcademy.com under the success stories page. But she was a student in one of our 2016 Package Your Genius Academy cohorts. And she was going through a, a tumultuous time personally. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, she ended up getting divorced. She was a professor at a, a university and she just couldn't make her way onto the tenure track, even though she'd done amazing work. She, she'd been pioneering in the journalism space. So she's actually um, a pioneer of mobile journalism. And so they call it Mojo for short, but she was one of the first actual working journalists and professors to teach um, how people were capturing movements and how everyday people were beginning to add their stories and voices to the journalism landscape. And she'd done all this amazing work. She'd had a Harvard fellowship, but she still couldn't get onto the tenure track. Um, she worked with us in the academy and she just was obedient and did, you know, the work of the lessons in the curriculum that we put forward in the academy. And she ended up getting some fluke, meeting someone who connected her to someone else. She ended up getting an interview uh, at USC, <coughs> excuse me, where their Annenberg School of Communications ended up getting a job moving from the East Coast to California taking this position, getting on the tenure track, like completely changing her life. And if you had told her that all of this was coming to her just one year before she stepped into this new life, um, I don't think it would have even been fathomable to her. And so for those of you who may be in a dark place or a difficult season of your career and your personal life, and I feel like it's all connected, right? Um, when we're struggling with our careers or our businesses, that just spills into everything else. Like we're we're unified beings. I'm one person, right? So if I'm struggling in my business, I'm not just like, I'm only struggling from nine to five, but then I can put my happy face on at six and just you know pretend like nothing is bothering me. But if you're struggling in a season uh, where you're not really sure how you're gonna get out of this place and how you're gonna move into your next phase, 
Um, the fourth shift is really about embracing the fact that even if you don't see what's on the horizon, like just imagine we're in a fog, right? And you can't even see 10 feet in front of you, but there's something magical um, on the other side. Once this fog breaks and dissolves and lifts, there's something um, magical waiting for you there. If you can embrace that and really believe that for yourself, um, it really goes a long way in stepping into this personal brand authority. So again, um, she did the work. She was not a fan of uh, writing and blogging and sharing her opinion. Another behind the scenes person, she was a journalist. So, you know, that sounds like someone who's out front, but no, she was used to interviewing her subjects and teaching her students and sharing their stories. And she had to make that decision to start putting herself out there. And in addition to her landing this coveted position at USC, which is one of the, very, the t I, it may be the number one journalism school in the country, um, getting on the tenure track, she also got a book deal uh, based on the work that she'd been doing in mobile journalism. So again, going from being in a space where she was undervalued and her colleagues uh, were not willing to promote her to the position she rightfully deserved to doing a complete shift and just being elevated in, in a space um, that was revered, right? It's, it's all possible once we step into sharing who we are. And it started with her sharing who she was and what she had to offer and really letting people know how amazing she was and she is she's so amazing and so humble such an amazing person so the fifth and final shift <clears throat> before we jump into the nine steps of actually becoming known <clears throat> is to let go of the how and this picture is um one of our most recent graduates this is rebecca thompson now, rebecca literally enrolled in packager genius academy last october so one year from like now or one year before, not from now, behind now, I don't know, a year ago, <laughs> one year ago, uh, we had a call and she was telling me about how she was pivoting from politics, but she just wanted to change her life. She wanted to be a light worker. I remember her saying this. She was like, I want to be a light worker. And we both were like, well, I was like, well, what is that? what does that mean? Like, what is a light worker? She's like, I just, you know, I'm burnt out from politics. I'm tired of this life and this, you know, the grind. I ran a race. I lost my race by six votes. Um, but I've been really great at helping other candidates figure out how to package themselves to run. But I am sick of this work. I'm really good at it. I've had some amazing success, but it's burning me out. And I can't sacrif my, sacrifice myself on the altar of this work any longer. I need to move into something that fuels me and lights me up. So Rebecca has just been this powerful example of what happens when you let go of the how. So when we had our conversation uh, about her joining the academy and she mentioned that she wanted to be a light worker, I said, okay, uh, well, the first step will be just figuring out what you have that we can mold and package. Like, what is it that you bring to people beyond this whole politics piece? Because obviously we don't wanna package that and sell that, you've already packaged that. So looking beyond or outside of the politics, uh, what are some areas that may be, um, you know, you have some transferable skills and talents where you can help people in a similar way, but it, we won't be using politics. And I remember we started, she enrolled in the academy and she was kind of doing the work, but she kind of wasn't doing the work. And I remember we had a one-on-one -on -one coaching call and I said to her, okay, Rebecca, like, Cause she was, she was stressed out about the idea of leaving her job and not having a job. And I was like, but you have clients, like people are paying you. And she's like, yeah, but I only have a contract for a couple months. And I'm like, but that's something. And then after that, you'll get this. And I kind of talked her off this ledge and she, it clicked for her that she was creating what she wanted to see, but she hadn't given herself permission to step into it. And she was holding very tightly into onto how am I going to, become this coach, this person who, who works with women and helps set them free. And when she finally surrendered to, I don't have to know how this is going to work out. I don't have to know every single step of this journey, but I'm going to do what I'm asked and I'm going to let it unfold because there's a powerful 
um, thing that happens when you get into action. So many of you um, may be feeling stuck, right? Like you may feel like you don't know the next step. And so you're not doing anything. You're just holding on to, to being still. But what you'll find is in the longer you hold on to being still and not moving at all, the harder it is to get any traction or momentum. You have to be moving to create momentum. So Rebecca let go of the how of like how it's going to look and what it's going to look like. And long story short, she started the academy a year ago after leaving an industry that she hated and not knowing what or how things were going to map out for her. And now she has a very successful coaching business that she has built from scratch. Um, She has uh, workshops called Live In Your Light Boot Camp. She just had her first live event and she's helped dozens of women. She's literally created. I mean, she attacked our content with ferocity and she has helped so many people and the ripple effect that it's creating um, through her clients has been really powerful. But it started with her not knowing so many of us are so controlling and we want to know exactly how things are going to map out. But sometimes you just have to trust that by moving and taking the next, the first step and then the next step and then the next step after that, not necessarily knowing all of the how it will unfold if you let it. So that's the end of my woo for the evening. I want to now talk about, um, the practicality of becoming known. And so I, talked a little bit earlier about <clears throat> me being unemployed and and you know figuring out okay how do I get in front of people who may need what I have to offer and who may be inclined to pay me because I have this new more make Baby and bills and I know I've got gifts and talents but I need to also make some income from them and so the steps that I took um to go from being this unknown journalist to being a nationally recognized PR professional. So I won the National Black uh, Public Relations um, Society's Practitioner of the Year Award, and then left, decided, okay, by PR, <laughs> I'm moving to personal branding. And I created a toolkit called the Branding Box, which got a lot of attention. And I ended up being named one of PR Week's 50 innovators in PR for that. Um, so pivoting, but but creating visibility for myself along the way, it really comes down to the nine steps that I'm going to share with you uh, right now. But those nine steps can be kind of categorized because I know it's kind of overwhelming to be like, nine things, what? The nine steps can be categorized in three buckets. So for those of you who are like, okay, Amanda, just tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. Grab your pen because I'm going to tell you the things that you basically need to uh, be doing and the checklist that you need to create if you want to become known. So for those, those are my DIY people, those who are like, I know how to work. I know what to do, or I know, you know, how to get moving. I just need direction. I need you to focus me. I'm about to focus you. Okay. So let's get focused. So the three broad categories. Number one, you have to know how to characterize your magic. Number two, you've got to know how to package your genius so others can consume it and you. And number three, you have to know how to pitch yourself. So characterize your magic, package your genius, and pitch yourself. What does it mean to characterize your magic? So the thing about becoming known is you have to cultivate your own audience. And if you want to build an audience, you have to be willing to share how you help who you help, the problem you solve, and what makes you different. Those are kind of the broad categories of what you need to be working to characterize. So again, um, sharing how you help people, who you help, the problem that you solve, and what makes you different. If you can get all of that together, people will know that you're the real deal and that you're for them. The people who can benefit from your work um, will know that you're for them. Next Um, packaging your genius so others can consume it or 
consume it in you. This is really the core of the work that I do. And I think what makes me different and kind of what I zeroed in on as my magic, it's being able to hear what people are saying so that it becomes less about a conversation in these words that are floating around and it becomes a product. It becomes a bio. It becomes a video. It becomes a book. It becomes a course. It becomes you know, a, a keynote presentation. It becomes something that has been packaged so that other people and um, preferably groups of people, so not just one, one other person at a time, but groups of people can consume your genius, your ideas, your solutions, your tips, right? So how can people actually consume what you're doing? So for example, Dr. Moxley, Risha is here on... Um, on on the training and I know for a fact that Dr. Moxley is an amazing therapist. One of the best, if not the best, to ever do it. But the problem with Dr. Moxley is that the only people who get access to her brilliance are her therapy clients. And so, or her friends and family who may happen to have conversations with her and get the benefit of her genius. But for her genius to really be unlocked and reach the wider world, she has to package it into some, you know, learning modality, whether that's her writing her book down or her recording her podcast episode so other people can consume it, have their lives change, and understand, um, you know, over and over again that she has these gems to share. So I want you to be thinking about you and what you have to share with the world. How are you packaging it? Are the only people who know what you have to offer, the people who work with you on your job, your boss, your coworkers, your clients? If so, you're not packaging your genius. You are only serving the people who are in your life and who pay you and who are engaged with you. But when you talk about packaging your genius, it's about creating something that people can experience, they can go back to, they can consume whether or not you are here, right? Because you can't be everywhere. And Frankly, for some of us, we've forgotten more than most people have learned, right? And so it becomes a matter of just making a record of all the things and all the ways we can help people and just kind of getting it out of our heads and off of our hearts down on paper or down on video or down on audio or, you know, on the on the, the keynote stage where someone can record us and then you can go and watch it later if you want to, if that if that matters to you. So but that's the second big category, packaging your genius. And third, pitching yourself. So once you have packaged your genius and you've got um, something that you want to share, you know you have information that can help people, you know you've got a course or a talk or a book even, right, that uh, other people can consume and then take away and, and work through on their own in their own time. Um. You have to pitch yourself to get opportunities to share the fact that that exists with the world, right? So it's not enough to um, to to record the podcast, like to record the MP3 and just like put it on your computer. Like if if people don't know it's there, if you're not distributing it it does not make it to the people who need it. So in a similar vein, when you talk about distributing ideas, ideas are distributed through media, they're distributed through speaking. And then when you talk about getting paid from this idea distribution, that means that you are connecting with the clients who may want to pay you for your services or want to enroll in your course or your program or attend your seminar or your workshop. But that becomes a matter of you pitching yourself for those exposure opportunities where you're reaching lots of people at one time, so that's media and speaking, or pitching yourself to the individual clients who may resonate with the way that you um, conduct your services, the way that you teach your voice, the way that you break down a concept. So pitching yourself to them to take that next step. And that's really you know, the bulk of it. Those are the three broad categories of becoming known. I'm now going to break them down a little bit further into nine steps within those three categories for those of you who want to go, go, go. So <clears throat> I talked about characterizing your magic. And um, this is really 
this is really what I did. Like sometimes I'm just amazed at like the ways that that we inherently know how to do certain things. So some of you inherently know how to fix a car or uh, raise a child or cook a meal. I just inherently knew how to do this. I don't know how, but like when you go back and I'm like, what did I do every single time? This is what I did. So <clears throat> number one, get clear on your brand. And over the past decade or so, I have kind of extracted a process and a set of question, a series of, um, it's an inquiry based process where I help people really get clear on their brand. And for those of you I'm trying to think, oh, missed opportunity. I was going to grab a copy of my book because my book Package Your Genius takes you through it too. So um, for those of you who haven't read it yet, Package Your Genius, Five Steps to Build Your Most Powerful Brand really takes you through that inquiry process. But first you have to get clear on your brand. Before I promote anyone or anything, I want them to um, to understand exactly what it is that they're promoting. And I want them to feel really sure and confident and clear in the fact of who they are, not who someone else told you to be, not who uh, your boss or your colleague ha has is paying you to be, not who your mom and your dad wanted you to be growing up, but who you really are, what you really enjoy, what really lights you up, what you really want to be doing with your time and your talents. That is that is probably the most fulfilling part of my work beyond um, getting people's name out there and getting them on TV. I love doing that too, but really helping people get clear on the what, the why of my life, the, the what am I supposed to be doing here? What is my purpose? What lights me up? What um, would make it amazing to wake up to and do every single day? Like, what do I enjoy? What has me grinning from ear to ear? Get clear on your brand. That's number one. You cannot pass go without getting clear. Number two, you have to find the value you're creating and make the case. As I mentioned before, many of us are creating value for the world. We're creating value for people in our lives. Um, and we're not even claiming that value and leveraging it for the things that we want. But first, you have to understand what value am I creating for other people? And then how do I make the case? How do I explain that uh, very clearly through the examples that I share of how I've helped people in the past so that new people who want to connect with me know exactly what I do and they can see themselves in those examples that I've shared? That's all that making the case is. And we have a very specific process that we take students through in terms of how we make the case through really compelling case studies. We use a narrative arc. <clears throat> we first state you know, the problem or the situation that your clients may have found themselves in, what your approach was, what your methodology was, and what were the results. So we make sure that you're telling a story when you make the case uh, about your, your past work. <clears throat> Number three, craft a compelling message. And so we really want to put steps one and two together um, into a message that really makes sense um, and, and sells you. So remember I said that if you don't have that clear message, it's really hard for people to get what you're doing and how you can help them. So you can do great work all day long, but if you're not able to communicate and use the right buzzwords and keywords and scenarios that breaks it down for the person who's listening. So as soon as you start talking or as soon as they start reading your bio on LinkedIn, they know exactly who you are. They know exactly what you do and they know if you can help them. So that's really, really important to be honest with you. Um, steps one, two, and three are a process in and of themselves. You could honestly just do those three and feel tremendous clarity and feel really great about the next phase uh, of, of your, your work because you know who you are and you've characterized it. But if you are trying to really kind of become known, uh, we move through the next steps, which are define your genius ideas. What is it that you have to share and say to the world um, that other people, maybe even people who are in your industry and do the same exact things that you do, how are you saying it differently, right? Like, what is it, what is your take on your specific area or your corner of your industry? 
You have to share your stories to build your audience. A piece of differentiating yourself is sharing the personal stories that have gotten you to where you are, right? Um, your mission, your why, what made you get into doing this work? How are you sharing um, those stories on social media or through your presentations, through webinars like this, on stages, if you're doing keynotes or workshops, how are you connecting with your audience? Because remember, if we're building an audience, we have to connect with them. And to connect with them, we've got to be vulnerable to some extent and share the stories of our lives that have made us who we are. So what are the stories that you have um, in your toolkit that could be leveraged to connect with the people who need you? Next, because we're in a digital world, we need to optimize our digital assets. And by that, I mean, you know, how are we using keywords to get in front of the people who may be searching for us? I would say that <clears throat> about 50 to 60% of the incoming uh, cl uh, clients, students, and opportunities, be they speaking opportunities, um, you know, book, bulk, book order <laughs> opportunities from my book. <clears throat> Um, and just the people who inquire about my classes find me by searching for um, certain keywords related to my brand. So not me, but they're searching for a personal branding coach. They're searching for personal branding presenters. They're searching for um, personal branding tips. Once someone searched for personal branding for therapists and they found me. And so how are you optimizing what you have out here on the web so that you become attractive to people who are searching, not for you specifically, but for the solution that you provide? Right. That's really critical. Uh, a lot of us are leaving a lot of room and a lot of money on the table because we're out here, but we're not optimized. So even if we have a great website, it's not optimized. No one can find it. Right. It's not showing up on page one of Google for whatever search term that, that you are. So if you're a therapist in Georgia or uh, if you are a coach in D.C. and people are Googling relationship coach or um, couples therapist, Atlanta, and you're nowhere to be found, right? You've got to optimize your digital assets. Then we want to move on to connecting with the people who you can help, connecting with them in person. So be that at networking events, speaking from the stage. That's always my preferred method because I feel like um, you get so much more bang for your buck when you're the speaker at an event because uh, you have a captive audience, people see you. And then afterwards, it just creates its own natural networking opportunities because people want to talk to you and kind of take the conversation farther if um, what you said was of value to them. So how do you figure out where you need to be networking, where you need to be connecting with others, where you need to be speaking? It's not so much about just saying, hey, I'm available to speak. Hey, I want to go network. If you live in a city like Washington, D.C., there are networking events literally every single night. How do you pick the right places? Um, how are you strategic about where you show your face, what rooms you're in? And then also, uh, how are you strategic about the places that you're speaking so that you're attracting the people that need to know you? Uh, it doesn't do me any good to be in a room full of people who have absolutely no interest in personal branding um, or have no interest in pursuing their calling or packaging their genius. If I'm speaking to a room of people who don't believe that is necessary or they feel like self-promotion is rude and they're just not open to it at all. So how are you strategic about picking the rooms where you circulate? Number eight, <clears throat> pitching yourself to speak and to share. Again, something I did inherently, did not really know I was doing it, but I remember as I was learning about social media and back then in the communications and PR space, uh, Everyone wasn't talking about Twitter and Facebook, but I saw the power of these free digital tools to connect with audiences and build communities and spread your message beyond just your um, geographic location, right? So whereas before you might market um, locally and connect with people, especially as a very small business or consultant, connect with the people that you could network with and meet at an event. And then all of a sudden, now you have this ability to connect with people around the globe in just a few seconds with this free tool. And so I got really excited about it. I started pitching myself to just 
share webinars, right? Like I, I wrote this blog. But I was like, well, I can I can talk more about this. I can share what on a webinar. Like I can do more. Who who wants to hear from me? And my willingness to pitch myself at first <clears throat> snowballed into me getting an opportunity because I raised my hand and I said, I have something to share. Would you extend your platform to me? To other people seeing that and then the invitation started to pour in so a lot of you if you're thinking about um if you're thinking about getting getting known through speaking and you're like well no one knows no one has reached out to me and asked me to speak sometimes you have to show up first in the way that you want other people to see you for them to even know that that's an option. So for me, I knew nobody knew me. So I said, well, who has a platform and who's running uh, webinars and workshops and who may need an extra speaker on the topic that, that I speak on? Let me send my stuff to them. Let me send them a deck, right? Let me send them a one pager on what I can share on. And that evolved because I delivered and I was good. And so once I delivered after pitching myself, those inbound opportunities started to come in. And that's one of the things we talk about too with media um, in our maximum exposure program. You know, if, if the media producers and editors don't know you, but you pitch yourself to be a guest and you deliver and you're great, um, then that can create opportunities for them to start saying, we want her back. And actually, I think that's what happened with Tiffany. She pitched herself to be on a morning show. She killed it. She was amazing. And then they had uh, an opening and they called her and said, hey, can you come back? And I think she had two segments on that show within one month. But you have to start with the pitching. If you're an unknown, you have to pitch yourself first um, before you can expect people to begin to call you and know who you are and invite you to their platforms. And then the last thing we talk about uh, in this process is just pitching yourself to get paid. So for many of us, becoming known and, and getting exposure, um, it's not about, um, <clears throat> it's not about, just being exposed to be exposed, <laughs> right? It's about stepping into our earning potential and, and earning more and landing clients and, and becoming the people who earn the money that, that we're meant to earn. I don't want to sound morbid, but in terms of runway and the time that we have to work at the level that... Um, we are at our best, it's a finite time. You know, many of us, uh, if we're lucky, we may get 15 to 20 years in our prime at our peak, and some of us less than that. And so if you feel like age-wise, you're at the peak of your energy and kind of your mental acuity, and this is like, you, you are really in your stride, but you're holding back and not negotiating for more, or you're not um, doing the consulting on the side to kind of shore up that income, you're leaving money on the table that you may really wish you hadn't left on the table in 15 or 20 years. Right. So I think about that a lot. Like, how can I maximize this season? How can I maximize my, my, my talents, my opportunity? How can I maximize this moment? Because I remember a time when you couldn't get on Crowdcast and talk to a hundred people you know, on Sunday night, right? And so how do I maximize this moment that may last forever and may not? Things shift, things change, technology changes, people's attention span changes, uh, a need for a certain area of expertise, a topic or discipline, all these things shift. And so we really wanna seize ourselves, seize the moment and pitch ourselves when our moment is here, all right? So those are the nine, um, the nine processes. And as I mentioned before, if you heard all of that and you're like, okay, great. <laughs> I have nine things to do now. I'm going to go work on that. Godspeed. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. And I'm glad that that was helpful for you. But if you heard me go through those nine steps and you thought, this is great. This is amazing but it's going to take me a minute to actually execute on the nine steps. And actually I could use a little bit of support, coaching and guidance. 
going through the nine steps, I need someone who can walk with me as I uh, embark on this journey. And so if that's you, I would love to, to hear you just type or see you type, I'm interested in the chat. Because as you may or may not know, I run a, a company called Packager Genius Academy. And Risha, Dr. Moxley is actually one of our um, coaches in the academy. She's our mindset mentor. She is a therapist, an amazing mindset worker who comes in from time to time to help us get unblocked when we're stuck and getting in our own way. Because again, as I have learned in doing this work, visibility and becoming known is not always just about the tactics. It's not about just, um, you know, taking the steps and doing the work. Sometimes it's about getting out of your way when you're faced with a tactic or something that um, feels uncomfortable. You, you're given an assignment. You're told to pitch the media and you thought that you wanted to be out here, but now it's really time to show up and, and put yourself out there. And it's hard. It's hard for people, um, especially when they're not used to doing that. So if you want some guidance uh, going through the nine steps to make yourself known, I would love to chat with you. Again, you can type, I'm interested in the chat. Hi, Judy. I would love to chat with you. And actually, hey, Susan, awesome to see that you're interested. If you see on the screen, there's a big green button underneath my deck that says submit your application. Again, I run a program called Packager Genius Academy. And we have a visibility academy that is starting this week. We have a PR program called Maximum Exposure that we are accepting applications for, but we haven't exactly decided a time for us to start that one yet. But if you are interested in Maximum Exposure, you can still drop I'm interested in uh, the chat below, but I don't have a start date for that. But our Signature Personal Branding Academy, which is a three-month experience, begins this week. And so essentially the nine steps that I just detailed, that is the curriculum for the academy. So if you're interested in someone really being a partner with you as you explore those nine steps and really go from um, someone who's doing great work, but maybe hiding. And you know you're not earning what you could be earning. You know you're not expressing your gifts publicly to the level um, that you could. You're not stepping in to your brand. You're not stepping into the status and to the level of recognition and the level of income um, and, and abundance that You've, you've been working so hard for, you've had your head down all this time and you've become great, but your stature in your industry, your recognition in your industry just doesn't match that. And it bothers you. Now, if it doesn't bother you, then okay, <laughs> that's fine. Thank you for coming. But if it bothers you and you know that you need to become more of a recognized name in order to earn what you want to earn, but also to create, um, almost like an insurance policy for yourself in case something shifts or change as, you know, as time moves on, things change, right? So if something changes with your current job, if something changes with your industry, if something changes with your business or maybe even your biggest client or the type of client that you work with, you know, external forces, technology shifts, um, tariffs there's all sorts of things happening in the world but i feel like when you are a known entity you have a leg up because at any given stage you can start over because you have your name and your reputation and you're known um and even if you have to shift how you use your gifts and talents people know your track record and they know that you can deliver on some level but if you feel like you've been delivering kind of in the back and only these five people know about you, that's a problem if something changes. So even if you're not necessarily interested in doing this work, um, I just want to plant that seed for you that becoming known is absolutely something that you should put on your to-do list, maybe for 2020, because we all need to have uh, some sort of reputational insurance that we can fall back on should our current situation change. 
So our current industry, our current job, our current client situation, all of that change. So if you're interested in this, this cohort and potentially joining us, just click that green button that says submit your application. It's free to submit. You just you know, fill in a couple of questions where I can get to know more about you. And um, after you submit the application, you'll be pointed to a screen where you can book a call with me. Um, I have made some time available both tomorrow and Tuesday for those of you who are interested in booking a call just to kind of talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. I know I've been talking at you for over an hour at this point, almost an hour and a half. Um, and you've heard a lot from me, but if you want to kind of engage with me and tell me about you and, and tell me about what you're struggling with and what this training even brought up for you. And if I think that I can help and if I think our curriculum is a fit for you, just go ahead and click that green button, fill out the application. And again, after you click submit, you'll be pointed to my scheduling page where you can book a call. I make all the calls, so I will be calling you directly and we can have a nice chat about the work together. So this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, thank you for making time for yourself and for this information on this Sunday evening. It was my pleasure and delight to spend this time with you. Thank you for coming. Let's stay in touch. Bye.